Hi, I'm Shane. And I'm Miranda. We're Chicky. Join us as we undertake our biggest road trip to date. Five months around Australia in a four-wheel drive. After a year of closed borders due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were finally able to travel from New Zealand to our closest neighbour, my home country of Australia. Each episode will take you to a different region in this diverse continent and get up close to its unique wildlife, camping in the outback and Aussie bush. If you've ever wanted to explore Australia, then this series is for you. Join us on Global Travel Stories. In this episode, we depart Ballara and head back to the West Coast. Above the water, we explore the pristine Cape Range National Park and below, the famous Ningaloo Reef that fringes its shoreline. From Exmouth, we sail the coast, exploring some of the outer reefs in search of the giants of the sea. We head to the Coral Coast and visit the famous Quabba Point blowholes. We get up close to dolphins at Monkey Maya on the Shark Bay Peninsula and discover firsthand how it gets its name. We grab our tanks and fins, daring to dive with ferocious predators at the westernmost point of mainland Australia. Follow our journey on Global Travel Stories. This episode starts off at the Ballara Station Stay in Western Australia. We say goodbye to some of the friendly furry locals and try some delicious scones with jam and cream before heading to the Northwest Cape. So according to the information we just read, it is actually a turtle mating season, so that's where they mate in the shallows. Um, it's a bit windy today, but we're hoping to get some snorkeling done today and see some around and about. So we're here at Ned's camp at the Cape Range National Park in Western Australia, just outside of Exmouth. Uh, the plan today was to go uh, snorkeling down on Ningaloo Reef, but the wind was absolutely chaotic. Um, we found ourselves a little quiet spot here so we can do a little talk. Um, it has calmed down a little bit, I'd say, so I am slightly optimistic about going out and snorkeling tomorrow, but that's the main reason why we're here, so I think even if it's windy, we're still going to embrace it. Um, sunset. Is just around the corner and we are in the prime spot for sunset on the west coast overlooking the beautiful Indian Ocean. Alright, so we're finally going to go snorkeling on Ningaloo Reef out here in the Cape Range National Park. So we're heading out to Mesa now, which is at the end of the beach, and uh, apparently there's a small bombing off Mesa and might see some corals, fish, and some turtles. We did see a shovel-nosed shark earlier. I'm not sure if I caught that or not on camera, but yeah, it's pretty cool out here. Both Ned's Camp and Mesa are part of the Cape Range National Park. All of the campgrounds in the park should be booked well in advance due to their popularity. We were very lucky to find a couple of nights free, booking a few weeks in advance. So 
So we're here at the famous Oyster Sacks right now. As you can see here, the reef is right off the shore. In fact, it's only 320 meters, which makes this the narrowest point of the Ningaloo coast um, from the beach to the reef itself. You can see back there as well, this is uh, the Cape Range. And uh, Cape Range is actually the old reef system. So this is the edge of the old reef going back millions and millions of years ago. It's basically all limestone now, which is really cool. I'm gonna go check out the current reef system then. Situated on the Ningaloo coast near Exmouth, Cape Range National Park consists of pristine beaches, deep canyons and rugged limestone ranges. These features were a direct result from wind and water erosion over time, combined with a gradual uplifting from the sea floor followed by fluctuating sea levels. The adjacent Ningaloo Reef is Australia's largest fringing reef, stretching more than 300 kilometres along the Northwest Cape. It's one of the most accessible reefs in the world, and Oyster Stacks is the closest location to land. The Oyster Stack snorkeling area consists of five isolated islets that protrude from the reef, which are covered with oysters. The crystal clear waters combined with the abundance of marine life is what draws many people to explore the Oyster Stacks. If you plan on visiting, it is important to check the tides as you need a minimum of 1.2 meters to snorkel there. From the Oyster Stacks, we made our way down to Turquoise Bay. Named for its stunning turquoise waters, the bay itself is also a hotspot for sea turtles grazing on the seagrass. coast provides important feeding grounds and nesting beaches for several species of sea turtle, including the hawksbill, loggerhead, and green sea turtles. Green sea turtles in particular are abundant in the shallow lagoons where they enjoy feeding on the seagrass. That was Turquoise Bay, very busy right now during school holidays. And uh, before that we had the Oyster Stacks, and Oyster Stacks you have to sort of go at maximum high tide um, when it's at least, was it 1.2 meters? Yeah, 1.2 meters above the actual uh, corals themselves. Um, yeah, my personal preference, I do like both of them, but I kind of liked it here because I got to see the green sea turtles, but uh, both places were absolutely amazing. Right, Chicky?
On our way to Exmouth, we stopped off at the wreck of the SS Mildura. On the 13th of March 1907, the ship carrying cattle was blown off course by strong winds and trapped in a heavy haze. It struck the reef at full speed and became wedged. After several days stranded in bad weather, the crew were finally able to seek help. However, the cattle were forced to swim ashore, most of which drowned on the way. These days, the wreck has become a part of the reef, supporting shelter for marine life. The Harold E. Holt Naval Communication Station is located 6 kilometers north of the town of Exmouth. The station is shared with the U.S. and is used to provide radio transmission to the Royal Australian Navy, the U.S. Navy, and other Allied ships in the Western Pacific and Eastern Indian Oceans. The town of Exmouth was built in 1967 to provide support to the base. Just doing a little bit of cleaning, a little spring cleaning as they say. We're out of the uh, desert now, so we're uh, trying to keep things a little tidier and get rid of some of this red dust and glass from our broken back windscreen. While in Exmouth, the Whalebone Brewery is a must. We headed onto the reef with Ningaloo Discovery on a sailing catamaran. The wind had dropped from the previous days, however it was still quite powerful on the open water and we spent most of our time on the outer reef not far from where we snorkeled a couple of days prior. Even though we were out of season, we were set on trying to see and swim with the giant whale sharks of Ningaloo. These gentle giants are the largest fish in the ocean and unlike their razor sharp teeth cousins, whale sharks are filter feeders, mainly feeding on small fish, shrimp and plankton. They generally migrate to the area from mid-March to mid-July. Given that we had arrived in October, our chances were quite slim, but they had been spotted within a few days prior, so there was a chance. whale shark, but I did spot a white tip reef shark making its way around the reef. The marine life was plentiful, and we also came across a large ray hiding under a bommie. We may not have encountered what we came to see, but either way, an extra day on Ningaloo Reef was a worthwhile experience. Today we're going to stop in at the markets, just have a quick look and see if there's anything we want to buy, take with us before we head down south. Where are we going today, Chiki? Quaba Point. Quaba Point. We're going to go do a little snorkeling at the aquarium. Yeah. Hopefully today we should get there in high tide. just crossed the Tropic of Capricorn so we are now on the other side of the tropics no longer in the tropics so we've finally left the tropics for good for this trip which is kind of sad but summer is coming so it's not going to really be cold I'm gonna make this brief because there's a lot of wind out there and I'm kind of protected right now, but we're at the blowholes uh, down here at Quabba Point. Oh my God, they are massive. 
The Quaba Point blowholes are an incredible natural site where water bursts into the air, sometimes reaching up to a height of 20 meters. This is due to strong ocean swells forcing the water through sea caves and up out of narrow holes in the rocks. The blowholes are most powerful when surging in for high tide. Nearby we spotted a parenti, Australia's largest species of lizard, crawling around on the rocks looking for insects to snack on. access to a nearby reef known as the Aquarium. This area can be only snorkeled at high tide due to the shallowness of the water over the reef. Unfortunately, we arrived a little bit too late for the tide and our time snorkeling was cut short. tide recede at sunset as the gulls returned to roost on a nearby island. The place was absolute serenity. It's very hard to think that only a few days later, this quiet and peaceful campground would reach international headlines when a four-year-old girl, Cleo Smith, was kidnapped right from her tent where she was sleeping with her family. It led to a statewide manhunt for 18 days, which luckily resulted in her being found in the nearby town of Carnarvon, alive and unharmed.
Alrighty, so no dugons unfortunately at Gladstone Bay. It was just way too rough to even see anything. But um, we did see an emu and some sort of younger, I wouldn't say they were chicks, they were sort of larger emus on the side of the road. They were just way too quick for us to capture anything. But uh, we're down here at the Hamlin Pool, which is known for its stromatolites. And stromatolites are actually some of the oldest um, organisms on the earth, uh, going back 3.5 billion years. These ones here are about 3,000 years old but they're only one of two places on the earth to have stromatolites alive, that is. So um, it's actually quite an honor to go and check these out. Um, they are very fragile, so we can't walk out there. And there's normally a boardwalk, which was actually destroyed by a, a cyclone that came through the area here in April, um, caused a fair bit of damage. But uh, the reason why the stromatolites like this area is the same reason why we have a lot of seagrass and therefore dugongs in the area. And that's because of this salty, briny water that we have here. Um, a lot of these areas here in the lower tides get trapped off into small pools and the water of course evaporates leaving a lot of salt residue so the water itself is very high in salinity. So we're heading down onto the famous Shell Beach right now which is a beach composed of entirely just little white shells. Um, apparently the shells have been washed up here for approximately 4,000 years and the depth of the, the shell layer is about nine meters. So pretty crazy. Kind of looks like sand. All right, quick stop up here at Eagle Bluff Lookout before we uh, reach our campsite. Eagle Bluff Lookout is famous for being one of the best spots to see wild dugongs, a relative of the manatee, due to its abundance of seagrasses. These seagrass nurseries have been found to be receding and under extreme threat due to climate change. We had planned to stay nearby overnight, however, by the time we arrived at the camp, office phone operating hours had closed, so we decided to continue on to Monkey Maya, where we found the true meaning of WA, windy always. hectic and crazy night last night um, the wind is almost reaching gale force and apparently tonight it will reach gale force so we're sort of um, at odds ends trying to figure out what to do at the moment uh, whether or not to stick around Shark Bay or go somewhere else or maybe just try and see if we can get um, some cheap accommodation and hunker down but it's pretty chaotic right now which sort of puts all our plans uh, out of whack. Uh, we're supposed to be going to do the dolphin interaction right now in Monkey which um, I feel like there's going to be like massive waves out there in this like still tidal pool so we'll see what it's going to be like when we get there. <laughs> In the morning, we were greeted at our campsite by an emu and his chicks before walking down to the beach for the thing that Monkey Myra is most famous for. Each morning, crowds gather as bottlenose dolphins approach the shore. The tradition dates back to the 1960s when a fisherman and his wife began to feed them part of their catch. This gained the dolphins' trust and the dolphins have been swimming up to the shore ever since. Today, dolphin feedings are carefully supervised by park rangers, ensuring that their natural hunting behaviors remain unchanged. They keep a careful record of which dolphins are fed, making sure that they're only fed a small portion of their daily diet so that they're not discouraged from hunting, socializing, or doing any of their other normal dolphin behaviors.
After the dolphin feeding, we crossed over to the other side of the Shark Bay Peninsula to find out how it gets its name. All right, Chicky, where are we? Shark Bay, Ocean Aquarium. Yeah, Ocean Park Aquarium. We're about to do the aquarium tour. Not usually fans of aquariums, we had heard good things at the visitor center in Denham about the conservation efforts and research the Ocean Park Aquarium conducts, and we thought we would check it out. The animals seemed very well taken care of, and our guide was very passionate about shark conservation. We would consider this a must do when in the area. He's so excited. <laughs> Oh. This guy's called Toby. He looks like a shark, doesn't he? Does yeah. anyone know what he is? Cobia. He's a Cobia, absolutely. He is a monster Cobia. He weighs about 45 kilos. And the world's record Cobia was caught here in Shark Bay, and he was 62 kilos. So another 20 kilos on his coat. Yeah. Our biggest mile away is Max. So you gonna spit? No, you need a little bit. No, from Max and get us. And we've also got some more Trevally in here. And what do you think, Miranda? <laughs> There's a lot of food. <laughs> This is a very typical scene in the town of Denham. After our windy sleepless night prior, we decided to get a room in town at an Airbnb. Alright, 
right, so we've just stopped off at the Little Lagoon where we'll have a brief break before heading towards Francois Perron National Park. On the way to our big lagoon campsite where we'll hopefully get a spot tonight, we're going to stop off at the Artisanal Pools, uh, which are hot pools free to National Park pass holders so that's pretty cool and we're hoping to make it up to the top of the cape today but uh not sure as we heard the conditions of the roads are really not ideal pretty sandy so um we'll see if we can make it there So back in the 1880s, uh, the peninsula that is now known as the Francois Perron National Park, they had established a sheep station here on the peninsula itself and uh, the pastoral lease itself expired in 1999 which is when, when it was bought up by the government and uh, declared a national park for conservation purposes. It is a declared UNESCO World Heritage listing site and the reason being is one, the natural beauty, two, the history of the area as well, so not just the European history but also the Aboriginal history it goes back, you know, millennia. The main reason is because of the conservation of rare and endangered species and its biodiversity. So today we have here on the National Park a conservation project known as Project Eden, which basically aims to not only eradicate all the pests and uh, reintroduce a lot of the rare and endangered species that once inhabited this area, like the bilbies that we see over here. So several reasons why this place is important. Having a look at some of the history of the place, like the station itself, we have what is known as the Artisanal Spa. It's an old pool that they use the natural waters that flow underground, bathe in basically and they are open to the public. That's why we have our towels. I'm gonna to go check out the artisanal spa right now. How is it? It's really hot. <laughs> it's warmer than I thought. <laughs> Temperature is around 40 degrees and it uh, comes from underground. It's not really supposed to go under. You definitely wouldn't drink it. Alrighty, so back out in the soft sand. Uh, we're gonna do 18 PSI on the front, 20 on the back, and uh, I think we should be good. On the soft sand now since Fraser Island, I don't think. Lagoon is absolutely a must visit on the peninsula and quickly became one of our favorite spots in WA. With its red sand and turquoise waters, it's very surprising that Francois Perron National Park doesn't receive the same attention places like the Whitsundays may command. National Park is named after the French naturalist and explorer Francois Perron, who is the zoologist aboard Nicholas Bauden's 1801 and 1803 scientific expeditions to Western Australia. The region had been inhabited by the indigenous Malgana people for over 26,000 years. After a quick snorkel, we chilled out by the lagoon before enjoying a spectacular sunset from our campsite. Good. So good. <laughs> Caramelized onion cheese with sun-dried tomato and Italian herbs crackers. Yeah. A flavor explosion. a few 
days exploring the region on the land, it was time to check it out below the water. So we're with Shark Bay diving now, and we're about to go diving off of Steep Point, which is the westernmost point in all of Australia. So be fun! Unfortunately, not long after submerging, my GoPro malfunctioned. This dive was a cool spot beneath the steep cliffs. With abundant sea life, it's a favourite spot among fishermen. This is Derek Hartog Island here, and our first dive time of the day is Purple Rain. Now you gotta sing. GoPro apparently fixed, we submerged the second time. We had a short swim to reach our dive area, but already things started to become more interesting as we approached. Passing coral structures and schools of fish, we made our way to cavernous formations lined with soft blue and purple corals that gave the site its name. Purple Rain soon became one of our favorite dive sites. Upon approaching the cavern, we came across a giant groper meandering by as we gave it a pretty wide berth. fish erupted from within the structures. Exploring inside filled us with wonder as we approached the densely packed multicolored corals. Not long after entering the first few structures, GoPro issues started to occur for both mine and Miranda's cameras. Using cheap knockoff housing caused pressure leaks to compress the buttons and malfunction. Unfortunately, the parts we missed 
end up being the most amazing. In one cavern, we came close to not one, but two giant three to four meter gray nurse or sand tiger sharks. We kneeled in awe on the cavern floor as they circled around us and left the area. It was truly a spectacular experience and a lesson learned about buying cheap equipment. Our GoPros were fine once we resurfaced. As we cruised alongside the legendary Dirk Hartog Island, we were greeted by a large pod of dolphins. Upon arrival at our lunch destination, we were given the option to swim across to the island to explore, which we couldn't refuse. So I'm standing here in front of the Dirk Hartog Island sign because we are in fact on Dirk Hartog Island. Who is Dirk Hartog? He was a Dutch explorer in 16th he was the first European to land on the west coast of Australia. Dirk Hartog Island was named after the Dutch explorer Dirk Hartog. In 1616, he left evidence of the first European landing on Australia's west coast in the form of a plate inscribed with details of his journey. The place where he left the plate is now known as Cape Inscription. This is located on another part of the island. Dirk Hartog Island National Park lies within the Shark Bay World Heritage Area. The island has immense natural beauty such as rugged cliffs and pristine beaches perfect for fishing. Give ourselves a shark here in the water. As soon as someone says shark in the water, Miranda jumps in. Oh god. Hey. Crazy. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Spotting a potential man-eater so close to our dive site was unsettling, but we were reassured by our dive crew that there hasn't been a fatal shark attack in the area since the 1870s. This is likely due to sufficient fish stocks resulting in a healthy, undisrupted food chain. So we've left Shark Bay, which is, you know, kind of bittersweet. We like, we love Shark Bay. Um, it was really windy for most of the time, but uh, today was absolutely perfect. Hopefully we'll get back there. It was, it was such a beautiful day and I feel like there's so much more to explore in that area. We're at a place called the Billabong Roadhouse, which is just outside the peninsula of Shark Bay. And this is just a free sort of camp space that they offer here at the Roadhouse. And they also have free showers as well. So I'm gonna check those out and maybe even grab a bite to eat. Coming up in the next episode, we head south to the gorges of Kalbarri National Park with its nature's window and skywalk.
We stay at a historic campsite filled with abundant wildlife before exploring the rugged coastal cliffs of the National Park. After stopping by the Pink Lake, we head to one of the world's biodiversity hotspots during wildflower season. Hiking through an expansive natural garden at Lazur National Park and get up close to the native fauna that call this region home. We wander through a labyrinth of towering rocks at the Pinnacles Desert before heading back into civilization in the capital city of Western Australia, Perth. Join us on Global Travel Stories. At Global Travel Stories, we want to hear what you'd like to see more of. Please leave a comment below and remember to like and subscribe for our big adventures coming soon.